Blender 4.2 has just been released and it comes with a hugely anticipated change, some cool surprises, and a whole slew of quality of life improvements. I'm Jonathan Lampell from cgcookie.com and in this video we're going to cover everything that's new in Blender 4.2. One of the most interesting updates in Blender 4.2 is the addition of extensions, which at the moment can be either a theme or an add-on, both of which were already available in Blender before, but now they can be downloaded and more importantly updated from within Blender itself. Most of the add-ons Blender came with before are no longer pre-installed, which makes the download a good bit smaller, but you can still get them directly in Blender by going to the extensions tab of the preferences editor and installing them there, which will both download them from the internet and enable them. Another cool outcome is that this change has prompted some of the key features of the most used add-ons to be built into Blender itself, but more on that later. Once installed, you can still move these add-ons with Blender onto a thumb drive or a server and use them without any internet connection just like before. And if you're extra concerned about privacy, you don't need to be as the new allow online access option in the system preferences is disabled by default. What appears in the extensions tab in Blender is hosted on a new official Blender extensions website which allows anyone to add a theme or add-on to Blender if it passes a review. This website only allows for free and completely open source content to be submitted and only by the official creators. So it does not attempt to compete with the commercial add-on marketplaces, which will also benefit from these new features, since Blender can now support updating add-ons from remote repositories like GitHub or Blender Market. So it's a win-win all around. What all of this mostly means for you as a user is, in the future, less confusion about which version of an add-on you should install for your version of Blender, and an easier way to update add-ons when you want to. If you want to install an add-on that is not hosted on the Blender Extensions website, just click the drop-down, choose Install from Disk, and select its .zip file just like in previous versions of Blender. Add-ons for previous versions will work just fine in Blender 4.2, but if you're an add-on developer, you can support the new extensions features by adding a Blender manifest file that replaces the old blinfo in init.py. Full instructions are in the release documentation if you want to see all the details. Autosmooth is back, baby. At least in name. When you right-click in object mode, you can choose Shade Autosmooth, which adds a smooth by angle modifier to the object. It's also pinned to the bottom of the stack, which is another new feature. You can now pin and reorder pinned modifiers via the drop-down options. The increment snapped to during rotation snapping is now customizable, and absolute grid snap is now just another snap to option called grid. You can now add, clear, and copy modifiers right in the 3D view using the object menu. You can also add, remove, apply, and reorder modifiers on all selected objects by holding alt. You can now use edge and vertex sliding in the UV editor by double tapping G, as well as snap base by hitting B while transforming. The Add Images as Planes add-on is now built right into Blender. Just go to Shift-A, Image, and Mesh Plane, select your image, change any of the settings over in the sidebar, and click Import. The Curve Edit Mode for the new hair curves continues to mature and now includes converting hair types, an Add Menu, a new option for only drawing on to selected objects, Bezier Handles, and new operators for setting the handle type, subdividing, switching direction, and toggling cyclic. New variations of existing tools were added to Sculpt Mode, like Polyline Mask, Lasso Hide, Line Hide, Polyline Hide, Line Face Set, Polyline Face Set, Line Trim, and Polyline Trim. There's also a new operator for growing and shrinking which faces are visible, and a new option to use the Fast Boolean Solver rather than the Exact Solver when trimming. There's a new Frame Scene or Frame Preview range in the View menu and Tilde Pie menu that frames horizontally or you can press the home hotkey just like before if you want to frame everything vertically as well. The ease operator has a better curve to it now, and the sharpness can be adjusted. While using the operator, you can hit tab to toggle which property you're adjusting. Performance when navigating and transforming animation curves that have thousands of keyframes has been significantly improved yet again. This cheeky example from the developer shows how transforming 300 keys in an action with 10,000 keys is now buttery smooth, and he can now make a full bouncing ball animation by the time Blender 3.6 finishes calculating the same thing. The dope sheet has a new keyframe type called Generated, which just indicates that the key was set automatically by an operator or an add-on rather than by hand. Motion paths can now be themed. In the Shape Key Editor, non-relative shape keys are now visible and editable. Performance in the non-linear animation editor was also improved when zoomed in on a long action. Subdividing bones now correctly names the bones sequentially. The armature drawing mode stick can now use bone colors. You can now set the wire width for custom bone shapes per bone so that the most important controls can stand out. 
Bones can now be active even if they're hidden, so you can select a bone in the outliner and edit its properties even if you can't see it in the viewport. The limit rotation constraint no longer flips back to the minimum when it goes past 180 degrees. There's an option to use the old behavior for compatibility, and the tooltip is slightly snarky in the best way. If you didn't realize that you could just select multiple objects and copy a property's value to all the other selected objects, well, neither did I. But now you can also do that for drivers. Just right click and copy driver to selected. The Copy Global Transforms add-on, which is one of the few that still ships with Blender, got two new features. One bakes the animation to the camera so the motion matches up with it if, for example, you're animating on twos. The other allows you to copy and paste transforms relative to another object. Over in the Pose library, you can now blend a flipped version of the pose in the right-click context menu, or if you hold down control while dragging a pose asset, it will start the operation as flipped. There are a lot of exciting updates to geometry nodes in Blender 4.2, but I'm not going to tell you about them. Because I'm actually going to hand things over to Harry from Harry Blends. Thanks, John. Blender 4.2 brings a party bus full of new features, upgrades, refinements, and a whole new kind of socket to the noodly world of geometry nodes. There's a delicious assortment of exciting new nodes, and so many changes to existing nodes that you're going to have a hard time remembering what life was like before you watch this. Why don't we start with the Realize Instances node, which now gives you much more control over what you're realizing. Here, I'm using a collection of 16 cones and cubes as one instance. With Realize All set to True, they are all realized as real geometry. Switching it to False and with a depth of zero, the one instance remains unrealized. With a depth of one, however, the collection is realized, but the 16 cone and cube instances are not. And a depth of two realizes the collection instance and the 16 instances, giving us the same result as realize all. Next up, the rotation socket continues its campaign of world domination. The curve to points node now has one, and the Align Euler to Vector node, many a geometry node as first boss battle, has been depreciated, replaced with the Align Rotation to Vector node. There's a Rotation Input node and a new Axis to Rotation node. This allows you to take two vectors, in this example, the tangent and the normal of a curve, and convert them into a rotation. Next, the Sample Nearest Surface node and the Geometry Proximity node now have Group ID and Sample Group ID inputs, giving us much greater control over how we sample. I'm sampling the geometry's proximity to this empty, then scaling their faces by the distance from it. The Group ID separates the mesh into groups defined by what's plugged into it. I'm using the Mesh Island Index. Sample Group ID defines which of our groups we are sampling in, so we can sample the distance from Mesh Island 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 or 8. Or, if we use the Island Index as the Sample Group ID, the distance calculated for each face is the distance of its island from the empty. Next, there have been advancements in named attributes. Store named attribute can now store 8-bit integers. And for anyone who may have ever made the mistake of naming a named attribute after their X, remove named attribute now has a wildcard function, allowing you to remove attributes with the same painful prefix or suffix. Onward, and the mesh boolean node now has a float option like its Boolean modifier and edit mode counterparts. The Face Neighbors node has been tweaked for accuracy, and for those of us who found the crooked sockets on the repeat and simulation zones a source of great unease, harmony has been attained. They've even added a little tab to tell us when we're baked. The menu switch now has dynamic sockets, so we can plug away at full tilt when needs must and Capture Attribute has also acquired shiny new dynamic sockets too, because it needs them, what with it now being able to capture multiple attributes at once. And now we come to a full suite of new nodes, the Matrix nodes. We all understand transformation data being stored as three separate attributes, translation, rotation and scale. 
Well, now we can store all three of them on one attribute, the transform attribute. Look, matrices can be very difficult. I mean, sometimes people can make four of them and only one of them is any good. But the reward of a slightly steeper learning curve is a powerful new way of handling transforms because matrices is how Blender handles them under the hood. So you can think of these nodes as Duolingo nodes, allowing us to speak transform Blender's mother tongue and we'll all be guided in this new language learning frenzy by the inevitable incoming armada of YouTube videos from so many ready to teach us math. We'll all get through it together, you know, and the comment sections will be lit. Our last three nodes are three node tool nodes, mouse position, view transform and active element. Combined with the new wait for click option, these can be used to create more advanced and interactive tools. And before I go, I want to celebrate those extraordinary athlete nodes that have trained so hard to improve their performance. First, the grid, the captain of a group of nodes that has benefited greatly from thread optimization. Scale elements, which is now four to 10 times faster, and sample UV surface, which is 10 to 20 times faster on large meshes. And that's it, because that's what's new with nodes in Blender 4.2. I'm Harry Blends, and I hope this helped. Now back to John, who's about to blow your mind with EV Next. Thanks, Harry. You heard that right. The real-time render engine Eevee has been completely overhauled for Blender 4.2, and just about all of the core features have been improved in some way. Eevee now supports screen space global illumination that you can enable in the ray tracing panel, which, when combined with significantly faster light probes for caching light from areas not on screen, can make for a pretty convincing alternative to cycles in some situations. So convincing, in fact, that when I ran a comparison poll on Twitter featuring a scene that Eevee happens to work well on, most people guessed wrong. Some other noticeable improvements include the fact that shadows are now sampled more accurately using virtual shadow maps, removing the need for contact shadows. To get softer shadows, increase the number of steps in the shadows panel and increase the number of samples. You can also jitter the shadows like in the old version if you need more accuracy when they're really soft. Just be sure to turn it on for both the light and the viewport if you want to see the effect in the viewport. Also excitingly, volumes finally take the shape of the mesh, are more stable, and the resolution can go all the way down to one pixel. Refraction and subsurface scattering approximate the thickness of the mesh a bit better now, and you have fine-tuned control over that with the new thickness output and surface setting. Motion blur can now be enabled in the viewport during animation playback. EV now supports true vertex displacement, which is a game changer. The brightest spot in HDRIs can now cast configurable shadows. Sphere and cube reflection probes are now updated in real time. Depth of field was rewritten and optimized. There's also no shader limit now though your graphics card still has limits, so it's still something to be mindful of. Any one of those things would have been worth breaking out the champagne for, but to have them all at once is pretty amazing. Now most scenes should look comparable when you're migrating from Blender 4.1 to Blender 4.2, but it is like moving to a different render engine, so you can expect some little differences. You can check out the migration process listed in the documentation for all of the things that you might want to look out for. Cycles is not without its own exciting news though, because there's also an entirely new shader called the Ray Portal BSDF that lets you use vector math to warp the fabric of space-time itself. This has been used already to create everything from portal effects of course, to live camera feeds and really nice looking sword trails. The principled shader now supports thin film color effects like what you'd see on soap bubbles or a puddle of water mixed with gasoline, which is just gorgeous. The Huang principled shader now has a new rounded model that it switches to when the hair covers more than a pixel on the screen which drastically improves the quality of close-up shots without impacting performance when the hair is farther away. Spotlights and area lights with spread are now sampled more efficiently in volumes, and when combined with the light tree feature, the noise clears up significantly faster. In the View Layers tab, you can now render each layer with a different world using a new override. Cycles now uses a blue noise sampling pattern by default, which produces a clearer image at lower sample counts that can be denoised more easily. Open Image Denoise is now GPU accelerated on AMD GPUs on Windows and Linux, and it can optionally use GPU denoising with CPU renders. It's also been upgraded to version 2.3, which has improved quality. Rendering on Intel GPUs now uses their host memory fallback, 
which allows for rendering more textures than can fit on the GPU at once, which means you should be seeing those out of memory errors a whole lot less often. There's a new view transform on the block called Kronos PBR Neutral. It's not intended to be a replacement for AGX, but rather a better alternative to standard for when you need the color you set in the material to be exactly the color you get in the render. It's perfect for certain types of product shots where you need branded colors to be spot on. It doesn't hold up well under strong lighting conditions or super saturated lights, so it's not meant for truly photorealistic scenes like AGX is, but it handles bright areas significantly better than standard, and I think a lot of people are going to find this one helpful. Final renders can now use the new GPU compositor, which is a massive speed boost. Switch it over in the compositor sidebar or in the render performance panel, but even if you don't choose to use it, the CPU compositor has been rewritten and is several times faster than before. Some important effects of the change include the fact that the transforms are now immediately applied by the transform nodes, so scaling down an image destructively reduces its resolution. Also, the old compositor tried to infer an image size from upstream or output nodes, while the new compositor evaluates the node tree from left to right without inferring image sizes. These changes do do away with a few old school tricks, but overall make the operations much more predictable and intuitive. The viewport compositor is now limited to the camera region when in camera view, so that it better matches the final rendered result. In addition to that, you can now see how long each node took to calculate, similar to geometry nodes, by enabling execution time in the overlays. The glare node has a new bloom option, which is very similar to the bloom that was available in the previous version of Eevee, but is not present in this new version of Eevee. So if you're looking for bloom, head to the compositor, add a glare node, and set it to bloom. The old fog glow option does still work too, and it's now 25 times faster than it was before, though it's still quite a bit slower than the new bloom. The fast Gaussian mode in the blur node, which has been fixed now to be the same size as the other modes, now also works in the viewport compositor. The translate node has new pixel interpolation options. The hue correct node now evaluates the saturation and value curves at the original hue, not the updated one, and the curve now wraps around. The vector blur node has been simplified and now uses the same motion blur algorithm as EV. The strips in the video sequence editor got a visual overhaul and now have rounded corners, no handles on the sides, thicker outlines, half waveforms, and updated colors. Adjusting strip handles feels a bit nicer now with the new cursor change when hovering and the ability to tweak connected handles. In the overlays, you can now turn on or off the cache line. This menu has also been reorganized. Text strips now have new options for outlines, shadow placement, and shadow blur. You can now drag and drop multiple files into the video sequence editor at the same time. The AVI RAW and AVI JPEG file output types have been removed since the quality was the same as H.264 anyway, but with way larger file sizes and they took a lot to maintain, so they're gone. But on the performance side of things, both rendering speeds and playback speeds have been slightly improved. Opening up a new version of Blender is now slightly faster thanks to improvements in font shader compiling, which was apparently one of the slower parts. Undo is now two to five times faster, which is a huge improvement for complex scenes, with the trade-off that autosave is now slightly slower. Properties dialogs, confirmation dialogs, tooltips, menu separators, square color pickers, overlay text, and the status bar have all gotten a bit of polish. Tooltips for colors are especially nice now and show a chunky preview and the full values of the color. More tool shortcuts are now displayed in the status bar rather than the header. The Control shift hotkey to preview nodes in the Node Editor is now built right into Blender and you can use it without enabling Node Wrangler. A slight pixel shift when pasting images on Windows was fixed, and pasting images now works on Linux. Orphaned data was renamed to Unused Data in the Outliner, but the broken heart still reminds us that we should give it a home before it's too late. The File Cleanup menu now has a Manage Unused Data option, which just pops up the Outliner in that view, and Purging Unused Data blocks now lists exactly what will be deleted. The Blender file view of the outliner now shows user counts and lets you add or clear fake users. Control F now starts a search in the outliner, like it does in the properties and other data editors. A few miscellaneous UI scaling issues and icon size inconsistencies were fixed, so you can now work perfectly fine from 30 feet away or with a microscope if you really want to. The 3D mouse dead zone was set to zero for more convenient navigation with a space mouse. There's a new button to save custom themes, so you no longer have to create a new one with the same name to update. I certainly never noticed, but the default view was tilted by about 0.8 degrees, and that has now been fixed. The depth of field focus distance now has a picker that measures the distance of whatever you click in the 3D view. Composition guide visibility can now be toggled separately in the viewport overlays. There's a new key map preference called Region Toggle Pi that lets you toggle all editor regions with the hotkey N. Text can now be dragged and dropped into the text editor and Python console. The text editor now supports GLSL syntax highlighting. 
A really interesting new feature, especially for those working in games, is the ability to set export defaults per collection. You can set custom file paths and formats per collection, even multiple if you want to, and then export each collection individually or all at once from the file menu. The new hair curves object types now fully work with USD. USD importing now supports point clouds, and there are new options for Unicode files, defined prims, dome lights, and mesh validation. USD exporting has new options for filtering objects by type, dome lights, the up axis of the stage, X4 operators, triangulation, downsampling textures for USDZ, generating material X from blender shaders, and renaming UV maps to better follow conventions. Alembic supports the new hair curves objects type as well. It can import multiple files at once now, and there's a big fix for animated curves not updating during rendering. The Collada file type is now considered legacy, and it will be removed in a future version because the library it's based on has been inactive for six years and is becoming incompatible with modern code. GLTF importing has new options for setting bone size and shape, and its exporting has received a ton of fixes, as well as new options for vertex colors, centering root objects, and UDEMs. And along with hundreds of bug fixes, that's everything that's new with Blender 4.2. Download it today from blender.org, and don't forget to support the development fund while you're at it to make future updates possible. Thanks so much for watching, and happy blending.